Okay, I'm Chris Flanagan, and um, you're all really welcome today. Um, I'm going to talk for the next half an hour or so about ventilation of a critically ill child. So I'm going to split this talk up into two parts. Well, the first part's quite short. Um, I'm going to talk about what I think your starting setting should be when you've got a critically ill child. The second part, got the slightly longer part, I'm going to go through troubleshooting when those standard settings don't work and hopefully try and provide you with a few pearls that you can use to avoid getting into trouble in the first place. So starting off with our, what I would class the normal settings that are going to work well for most children. If you're used to ventilating neonates, you'll notice we use slightly longer inspiratory times in paediatric intensive care than probably what you're used to. Um, your eye time tends to increase as the child gets older. So for a neonate, I may be starting about 0.6 seconds, up to about 0.8 seconds by the time the child gets to a year, um, and a second round about five years. So like I say, it increases as the child gets older. Um, what tends to stay constant for most of our children is the IT ratio. So for most kids, an IT ratio of one to two, so one in to two out is gonna work well. Certain circumstances you use a shorter IT ratio and certain circumstances you'll use a longer one. Stephen's gonna talk about asthma later, which is a good example of that. Um, but that's, that tends to work well for most kids. Um, obviously we're using a long eye time and a standard IT ratio, that's gonna limit your respiratory rate. So for that neonate I'm talking about, you're maybe talking with a starting rate of about 30, 35 breaths per minute. And obviously as the child gets older, the respiratory rate's gonna go down. Um, and that would be what I would start off in most kids, and we'll often go out to the district generals and find children ventilated on standard neonatal settings, so there may be 50, 60 breaths per, per minute, um, and not clearing their CO2. And I get a funny look when I put them on the ventilator at 30 breaths per minute, as if that's not gonna work. But quite often it does work. Um, we find children with sicker lungs, you need a longer eye time to actually properly inflate the lungs, and then allow the lungs time to empty. Short, sharp eye times that don't actually, never really fully open the lungs, I tend, tend to be less effective. So like I said, that'll be my plan A. If that's not working, then obviously you're gonna to have to sneak the respiratory rate up. Um, and to do that, you're gonna to have to either sacrifice your IT ratio or your eye time. Um, most of the time, it's the IT ratio that will bring down, and you can use an IT ratio of one to one in an innate. Um, next thing you need to set then, obviously it depends on your ventilator. Um, it's either going to be a tidal volume or a peak pressure. Um, either way, we're trying to protect the lungs. So you're trying to get away with the minimum amount of ventilation that you need. So it's no different to what we do in kids to what you're used to doing in adults. Five to seven mils per kilo, 68 mils per kilo, depends where you read, but sort of low tidal volumes is what you're after. From a peak pressure point of view, again, you're trying to keep your pressures less than 30 if possible. Um, I would start most kids around about 20 and have a look at the child after you put them on the ventilator. See what the chest lift looks like on that pressure at 20, what the quality of the air entry is, what happens to your end tidal. Then make a little bit of adjustment and get a gas maybe after about 15 or 20 minutes. But it's worth doing those initial adjustments rather than just putting the child on and waiting 15 or 20 minutes because you can get a good idea, I think, particularly from the, how well the chest's moving and what the quality of your air entry is. Um, Oxygen, again, oxygen's toxic to the lungs, so we're trying to get away with the minimum amount of oxygen that you, you can, and ideally trying to keep it less than 60%. Um, so that's for most children, 88 to 92 would be the, the target. There's obviously times we'll go lower than that, and again, we might talk about some of those today. And there's other children you're gonna want higher saturations, and again, I'm gonna talk about a case later on that you would want higher saturations in. From a peak point of view, again, children with normal lungs need a decent amount of PEEP. So five or six would be the standard amount of PEEP I would be using for all children, even if they've got good lungs. So you shouldn't in general be putting children on the ventilator with no PEEP. Um, and thankfully that's rare that we find that now, but it still does happen. What is important though, is that you titrate the amount of PEEP you're given to the child in front of you. Um, so like I've said, five or six is okay for a child who's got good lungs, you're just trying to keep them inflated. If your child's got significant collapse consolidation on chest x-ray or is in 80% oxygen, don't just sit in the five or six centimetres of peep, put the peep up and keep putting it up until you get the lungs inflated. So you're trying to get your peep, you have to titrate to the child in front of you and use whatever peep you need to to properly inflate the lungs. Okay, so that's, that's a rough guide. That, those settings tend to work well for most kids that you're putting on the ventilator. Say you put them on and things aren't going to plan. They're not oxygenating well. 
they're not ventilating well, what do you need to do? Well, like everything in medicine, you need a system that you're going to use that you can troubleshoot the problem. If your problem is oxygenation or ventilation, you need to troubleshoot it quite quickly. Um, so the system I like to use is DOPES, and I'm going to go through this today. So D stands for displaced tube, O for obstructed tube, P for pneumothorax, E for equipment failure, and you've got three S's, stack breast, <coughs> stomach, and sedation. And we're going to work through each of those in turn. So starting off with a displaced tube, um, I'm not going to insult you all by talking very much about this tube. So this is the tube that's not actually in the trachea. Um, this should be fairly obvious. You know, the chest hasn't gone up and down when you ventilate the patient. You're not going to have end tidal um, and your patient's going to desaturate as well. And you're going to have a massive leak if you try to bag this patient. Thankfully, this is rare. And like I said, it should be pretty obvious. What's not rare, um, and also isn't always that obvious, is this type of displaced tube, and I want to spend a bit more time talking about this one. So by the time you've got this x-ray, this is the tube that's obviously in too far, so it's up against the carina, or the right main bronchus. By the time you've got the x-ray, the, this problem's pretty obvious, and what you need to do about it is also pretty obvious. Um, but the chances are you've ventilated this child already for 20 minutes, half an hour, with the tube in this position. Um, and certainly in the, over the last years, we've had a number of children with significant complications from this. We have pneumothoraces over the right side and significant claps over the left side, which has taken days to open up on the ventilator in the ICU. And what's even worse is that a number of these children don't have a lung problem to start off with. They've maybe been intubated for a seizure. So getting the tube in the right place before you get to the x-ray is probably one of the most important things about a displaced tube. So there's a few methods to do this. Um, one of them is you can use a formula. And we like to formulas in kids. There's lots of formulas to remember. And unfortunately, there's three formulas to remember when you're trying to work out how far to put a tube in. I think the bottom one is the one that most people will be familiar with. So it's the age in years divided by 2 plus 12 for an oral tube, or plus 15 for a nasal tube. And that's the one that's an APLS and everybody's pretty much aware of. The one at the top for neonates, um, you take the child's weight and add six to it for an oral tube, or add seven to it for a nasal tube. It's a, it's a really good formula. I find that to be pretty accurate. Um, and you can use that. I use it up to maybe three or four months, and I find it still to be quite accurate. Um, the one in the middle, I don't remember. Um, I don't use routinely. It is in the apps, the Pediatric Emergencies app and PICU Calculator. Um, so you don't necessarily need to remember these things. So that's one method you can use um, for trying to work out how far to put your tube in. Um, the other, you probably noticed a lot of the tubes have depth markings on it that the manufacturers have put onto the tubes. And they're designed to be positioned at the level of the vocal cords. And ideally, if you put your tube into the manufacturer's depth marking, um, it should be in a good position. But I think that really depends on what tube you're actually using. So we know this from work done by Wiesadal back in 2004. Um, and you can see a little um, graph at the bottom here. So on this, you've got three lines. Um, the top line is the level of the cords. The middle line is the mid-tracheal level. And the bottom line is the carina. And what they have done is they have taken all the currently available pediatric tubes, and they have positioned them at the manufacturer's depth marking at the cords. A couple of the tubes didn't have depth marking, so what they've done is they've put the cuff of the endotracheal tube a centimeter below the cords where you would want it. Um, and what's quite worrying here, when you look at this, despite a number of the tubes being positioned where the manufacturers say they should be, the tips are up against the carina. So that's obviously worrying. Um, on this next graph, what they've done is they've positioned all the tubes with the tip at the mid-tracheal level. So exactly where you would want this tube. If you look to get an extra, you'd say it was perfect. Um, but look how far some of the depth markings are actually above the, the cores, particularly this one, this one they're really far above it with the tube adequately positioned. Um, what's even more concerning is you can see the cuff of some of the endotracheal tubes are at the level of the cords, where there's significant potential for them to cause damage. Um, rather than just show you pictures, I thought it would be good to show you one of these tubes in action. Um, so we had a shortage of microcuff tubes, and we were having to use some of these tubes recently. Um, this is a three kilo baby who has been intubated with a size three cuff tube nasally. Um, we were having to reposition this tube because the tip of the tube is up against the carina. Um, but what you can notice on this, can you see just how where the, de the depth marker is? With the tip at the carina, 
the depth marker is almost disappearing behind the soft palate. It's that far out. And what's even more concerning, you can actually see the folds of the cuff at the levels of the, the cords. So that tube's completely inadequate for use in a patient of that size. And if you were relying on the manufacturer's depth markings, you're already at the carina where the tube was. You're going to be in the right main bronchus if you put it into the depth markings. This Portex tube we know from the work by Weiss et al. is pretty accurate. So going into the depth marking, the tube was adequately positioned. Um, and on x-ray it was perfectly positioned. So I think it really depends on what tube you're using, whether you can rely on the, the depth markings. And we know from the results of that study that none of the currently available tubes at that time were appropriate. And out of that study, the microcuff tube was developed. Um, it's important to say I have no financial relationship with microcuff, um, <laughs> because I've got to say lots of good things about this. I just like really good bits of kit, and this is a really good bit of kit. Um, so the depth markings in this tube are designed actually on scientific data from kids. So provided you've used the right size of tube for the patient in front of you, put it into the black marks, it should be adequately positioned. There's a few other things they've done with it. There's the, they've got the cuff of the tube all the way down near the tip, so it's not going to cause problems with the cords. And you've actually got a high volume, low pressure cuff, which is pretty rare for a pediatric tube. So there's lots of good things about this tube, and I would encourage you to, to use a microcuff tube in a sick child provided it's not contraindicated. Um, for positioning at the cords, where you want the, the, the solid black mark, you want that at the cords, and then you want to see all the other thin marks coming out if you're using one of these. It does have an, a few other advantages. You see why I've said I've no um, relationship with them, as you'd think I would the way I'm talking about it. But if you're putting a cuff tube in, um, you, do, you don't have to remember any formula at all. Um, it says on the back of the packaging, just like it does on LMA, what size of child to use it in. So it's great, there's no formula. Pick the tube that has the, the age of the child on it, put it into the black mark, and you're done. Um, the other advantage is when we talk about equipment failure later, leak around an uncuffed tube is one of the big causes of difficult ventilation or difficult oxygenation. Um, so I think our feeling is pediatric intensive, as most of us anyway, is that you should be putting cuff tubes into children if they're, if they're that sick. Final thing to mention on tubes before we move on, um, be careful where you're getting the size of the tube. Um, this tube, we size them on the internal diameter. This tube is a three and a half tube. It also has the outer diameter on the packaging as well. So the outer diameter of this tube is a five. And we certainly have had incidents where people have been looking for a 5.0 tube and I picked this tube up and put it in. They've seen the five on it. And obviously a child who needs a 5.0 tube isn't gonna ventilate very well through a three and a half. Um, so be careful where you're getting the sizing from. It's the internal diameter that you want. Okay, so that's the displaced tube. Moving on to look at the obstructed tube. Um, so the tube can either be completely obstructed or partially obstructed. Um, completely obstructed tube's pretty rare in the setting we're talking about, so this is a waiting for the retrieval team. Fresh tube going down, it's rare for it to get completely obstructed. Much more common in the ICU where the tube's been in for a while, it starts to block and then fully blocks, but it can happen. So what are you gonna see in a child who's got a completely obstructed tube? Well, obviously they're gonna be incredibly difficult to ventilate, the chest isn't gonna go up and down, and you're not gonna have end tidal. Probably the best way for you to pick this up and then potentially treat the problem is to get a suction catheter and try and get it down the tube. And that arrest in the suction catheter won't go all the way down, will maybe point you towards the fact that your tube may be blocked. Um, a word of caution on that, you can actually have it a number of cases where we were able to get a suction catheter down the tube. Um, it can go past the obstruction, come back out again, the obstruction seal up again. Um, so you may actually have to take your tube out um, to rule this out as a potential cause. I've certainly seen it a number of times in tracheostomy tubes as well, where your suction catheter goes down without any problem, but you take it out and it's fully blocked. So that's pretty rare. Um, apologies for this video, but it makes my point. Um, what isn't rare is a partially obstructed tube with secretions. This is just what the critical, the airway of a critically ill child looks like. It's full of secretions. And obviously everything's smaller, so secretions cause much more of a problem. They narrow the airway significantly more in a child than it will do in an adult. So one of the first things you should do after you intubate a child is go down the tube with a suction catheter and get rid of this. If you can't get the secretions out with that, you're probably going to want to do a bit of saline suctioning and bagging. If you can't get them out with that, you probably want the physios in to try and do it. Now Vivian's going to go through saline suction and bagging with you. Um, 
at the, in the lunch break. So if you're not familiar with doing that, that's probably one of the more useful things you can get out of today. So displaced obstructed piece for pneumothorax. So again, by the time you've got this x-ray, the problem's obvious. What needs to be done about it is obvious. Um, but again, you're talking 10 minutes before you get this x-ray and see it. Um, and it'd be nice if you could pick it up and treat the problem before those 10 minutes are up. And 10 minutes is pretty quick at times. Um, so what, what are you going to do to, to do that? And the best way I think of doing that is ultrasound. This is one of the easiest things you can do with ultrasound. If you're already using ultrasound for vascular access, I think it's just as easy as vascular access. What you need is a high frequency linear probe. It's the best one to do this with. And if you think if your patient has a pneumothorax and they're supine, it's going to be in the most anterior part of the chest, excluding a loculated pneumothorax, which is further back. But in the acute setting of a child, it's just developed one. It's the, going to be the most anterior part of the chest. And this whole assessment, is my video going to play? No. Nope. Uh, something funny about that video. It's moving it from a Mac to a PC. Um, I'll go back to it. But basically, all you're doing is getting your probe, touching it over the most anterior part of the chest, looking at the screen, over to the other side, looking at the screen. It takes 10 seconds to do. And you've got a clear answer as to whether your patient does or doesn't have a pneumothorax. So, more importantly, these ones are plain, which is more important. Um, so what you've got here, you've got a rib shadow here, rib shadow here, intercostal muscles in between them. You've then got this white shimmering sliding line here, and you've got these comet tails and bee lines coming off this line. So ignore all the other bits I've told you. What you're looking for is just this white shimmering sliding line. What that is is the two layers of the pleura sliding over each other, if you see that. And that's what it looks like. It looks like something sliding over each other. And if you see that, it tells you the two layers of the pleura are in contact with each other. They couldn't be sliding over each other if they weren't in contact. And if they're in contact with each other, it means there's not air between them. So you, do, you can't have a pneumothorax. So if you see this and you're over the most anterior part of the chest, your patient doesn't have a pneumothorax. So what does a pneumothorax look like? Um, and this is it. So this time you've got a single layer of pleura. So this is the, the top layer of the pleura. And the problem is ultrasound waves don't travel well through air. You pick your probe up, hold it above your patient, you don't get a picture on the screen. So your, your ultrasound waves travel down to that first layer of the pleura and then they hit air and they can't actually travel down through that air. So what you're seeing is artifact down below here. And can you see this image here is repeated here and repeated here again. It's almost like a mirror image you've got down below. That's what you get in the pneumothorax. It just depends how many times the, wa the waves bounce about before they come back to the probe. So here and here. So a single layer of pleura, no sliding, shimmering, no comma tails coming off it, and mirror image artifact down below is a pneumothorax. Um, if you're not sure, what you can do is put M mode through it. Let me see. So that's the normal lung. And in a normal lung, you get what's called a seashore sign. So see at the top, sandy beach down below. In a pneumothorax, you get what's called a barcode sign. And it's due to all those mirror image artifacts you get, you get this barcode type picture. I don't use M mode myself. Um, I just use the standard B mode and I think it's fairly clear on that. Um, when you look at the two together, I think it's pretty obvious. And like I say, this takes 10 seconds to do and you've got a, the ability to diagnose a pneumothorax at the bed space. <coughs> really simple to do. If you're not doing it, pick up a probe start scanning normal, so you'll very quickly be able to pick up what is abnormal. Okay, so that's pneumothorax. Moving on to equipment failure. So with equipment failure, I think the biggest problem in kids is putting onto equipment that's not suitable for them. So adding a lot of dead space into the circuit. Um, there's a number of methods you can use to ventilate kids. In Northern Ireland, most of our kids will go to theatre to be intubated if, po if possible. Um, so we ventilate it on anaesthetic machines. I'm a paediatric intensivist, so I don't use anaesthetic machines on a regular basis. Um, but I have asked some of my paediatric anaesthetic colleagues what advice they would want to share with you today about avoiding excessive dead space with anaesthetic machines. And the answer I got from a, a number of them was actually there's no harder fix rules. Um, you need to check in advance that the machine you've got is appropriate for all ages of kids, and in particular making sure you're not going to have to change the circuit on it at a certain age or weight. 
The other thing you can use is a transport ventilator. And again, it's equally important that you're using the right transport ventilator for the patient in front of you. Um, so this is the baby pack ventilator, um, pretty popular ventilator for small babies. Um, manufacturers say it can be used up to 20 kilos. And while it looks like this should be in a museum, um, it's actually a really, really effective ventilator. Minimal dead space. And if I can't ventilate a kid out and transport in this ventilator, I'm not going to do a better job when I get them back to the ICU and put them on the ICU ventilator. It's a really, really good piece of kit. Not such a fan of this one. Um, I find it's less effective, much more dead space. Um, manufacturers say with this one, it's okay from tidal volumes of 50 mils onwards. Um, although most transport guidelines are saying from 10 kilos onwards. I know if I'm trying to ventilate a 10 kilo child in this ventilator, I'm probably dialing up 100 mils, 10 mils per kilo. But I'm ventilating the child plus a lot of dead space. Um, the other thing with this one, be careful because there's two different circuits. Where there's a pediatric circuit and an adult circuit. The adult circuit has double the dead space of the pediatric circuit. So if you put a small patient on an adult circuit, they're probably not going to ventilate particularly well. And we know that there's been a number of medical device alerts out in this ventilator where the adult circuit has been used to ventilate a child recurring tidal volumes of 50 to 100 mils, and they just haven't ventilated at all well. And these are quite often with kids with normal lungs. I remember going out to get a 10 kilo child with febrile convulsion, normal chest, wasn't ventilating on this ventilator at all, CO2s of 12, 13. No matter what they did with the ventilator, the child wouldn't ventilate. Um, I'm now going to run through some of the common bits of kit that we use and look at the dead space values associated with each of them. Um, so starting off with long endotracheal tubes, um, this is something that gets my neonatal colleagues quite excited. Um, you've got the values up at the top with the dead space, so a 3O tube it's 0.28 mils per centimeter of dead space um, up to 0.5 mils per centimeter with a 4O tube. Obviously, as the tube gets bigger, the resistance to flow goes down significantly as well, so it becomes less of a problem. Um, what you'll see is these values, over the next few slides, you're going to see these values are actually really, really small. Um, so I wouldn't get particularly worried about these because cutting a tube isn't without risk. If you cut it in advance and you've cut it too short, you're going to have to intubate the child again. If you try and cut it afterwards and you get the connector out and can't get it back in again, you may have to re-intubate the child. So in the district general, I wouldn't be encouraging you to cut tubes. I think there's more risk and uh, you're going to get very little benefit given these values are quite small. Um, and titles, make sure you've got the right one for the size of your patient. Um, the uh, neonatal infant one has almost half the dead space of the pediatric adult one. So again, be careful you're using the right one. Obviously, if you put the larger one than the neonate, you're adding significant dead space. This one surprised me when I was looking at the, the values of dead space. The angle piece, 10.4 mils. It's a whopping amount. Um, we don't use them in the unit at all. We put our tube in directly onto the, the end of the endotracheal tube to of try and avoid issues with dead space. And then make sure you're using the right size of filter for your patient. Um, a lot of the manufacturers will say on the filters themselves what the recommended tidal volumes are. So you can see the recommended tidal volumes for each of these particular ones at the top and then the dead space is down the bottom. So if you had an infant who should have a filter with a dead space of about eight mils and actually put the adult one in with a dead space of almost 27 mils, you would expect them not to ventilate particularly well. It surprises you just how much dead space is in one of these things. But by far the worst offender is the catheter mount, a whopping 44 mils of dead space. Um, and this has been the culprit in a number of incidents we have had over the years where Children would not ventilate no matter what the district general team did with the, the ventilator. They had pHs in the sixes, CO2 is 14, 16, and it turned out it was adding the catheter mount into the circuit, just there was too much dead space for the ventilator to, to manage to ventilate the child. So please don't put these into the circuits in small patients. And remember, go back to first principles. If your patient is not ventilating well, take them off the ventilator, hand ventilate them. That keeps the child safe while you're troubleshooting things and also hand ventilating them is going to point you towards the, the cause as well. You get a lot of information from doing it. On to the last one, so we're on to the S's. Uh, stack press uh, is a phenomenon found mostly in asthma. So asthmatics don't have problems getting air into the lungs, but they have problems getting it out. The prolongation of their expiratory phase, they, they wheeze in expiration. And that's not a problem when they're breathing spontaneously. 
because they'll wait until they've got the breath out before they take another one. It becomes a problem when we put the child on a ventilator and if we don't allow them enough time to expire before the next breath comes along and that cycle is repeated again and again, with each breath the lungs are becoming more and more distended. Interthoracic pressure is rising and then eventually preload to the heart becomes impaired. Your child is going to quickly become hypotensive, bradycardic, and unless you do something, will arrest. The thing you do is you disconnect the child from the ventilator and leave the endotracheal tube open to air. If breath stacking has been the problem, you'll get hair hiss coming from the end of the endotracheal tube. Um, if that doesn't relieve things, you can manually decompress the chest. If neither of those two manoeuvres relieve things, then it's not breath stacking, and you should be looking at a pneumothorax. Um, there's ways to prevent this. Um, obviously, you want to set a long IT ratio. Stephen's got to, I'm sure, going to cover this in his asthma case. Um, and the other thing, you want to particularly follow this line on your ventilator. It may look different than the one you're using, but this is flow against time. Inspiratory flow above the line, expiratory flow below the line. So you're waiting for this expiratory flow to get back to baseline before the inspiratory breath comes along. And if it hasn't got back to baseline, your child's going to breath stack. Stomach is a big one, particularly in small babies. Um, it, it, while you've been providing face mask ventilation to your patient, you've hoped to fill the lungs up, but inadvertently you will have filled the stomach up. And in a small baby, it takes very little air to cause the stomach to be completely distended and splint the diaphragm. And this can make ventilation almost impossible. So if you, if you don't have a tube in already and you're not aspirating continuously during face mask ventilation, get one in pretty sharply after the intubation, decompress the stomach, and the chances are your ventilation will be much better. And then the last S is sedation. Not such a big problem for what we're talking about, waiting for the retrieval team, because most of the patients are going to be properly anaesthetized and probably muscle relaxed as well. It's more to think about when the child goes off in the intensive care. Are they fighting the ventilator? Is that the reason they're not oxygenating and ventilating well and actually sedating and possibly muscle relaxing them might be the solution. Okay, so say you've worked through your dose assessments and you're no further along. Um, what now? Well, I think the first thing would be pick up the phone and give us a call and we can run through things with you. We can agree a plan. It may be that you just need to deviate significantly away from those starting settings that I talked about. And like I say, those ones at the start are only starting settings for most patients. Patients with certain conditions, you're not going to start in those settings. Um, so I can think the last really sick asthmatic I looked after, I was using pressures in excess of 50 to just about move the chest. Um, that got us a pH just into the sevens. We were happy to tolerate CO2s of 14, buffering with some bicarb. Sats of 85 were just fine. And that was okay for the two hours it took for the spasm to break. Um, but before I think you make such a, an extreme change from normal ventilatory targets um, and pressures, um, you need to be sure you've got the correct diagnosis. So every, every year we see duct-dependent congenital heart disease, mislabeled as bronchiolitis or sepsis. Um, so for those babies, you actually start in prostate and open the duct up is what you need to do rather than doing anything with the, the ventilator. And again, babies with pertussis, their pulmonary vessels completely sludged with white cells, probably need an exchange transfusion rather than anything done with the ventilator. So make sure you've got the right diagnosis. Um, if we have a child who's not ventilating or oxygenating well, we're calling our physios into the unit pretty early. So if we're doing that, you probably should do the same. Every day in our unit, they turn pressures in excess of 30 down to 20. Um, and every month we have a child come down with life-threatening asthma, viral and juice wheeze, on multiple bronchodilators, high pressures in the ventilator. Physio sees them on admission. Suddenly the wheeze is gone. We turn the bronchodilators off and the pressures are 20. And that's because the airways are narrowed. I've shown you the picture of the secretions, but they're narrowed with secretions rather than bronchospasm. And if you get those secretions out of the chest, the, the wheeze quite often disappears. Um, nitric oxide, kids are getting more complex. Um, we have lots of extreme preterm surviving with chronic lung disease, lots more kids surviving congenital heart disease surgery. So pulmonary hypertension is more common. We do have the option to bring nitric out on transport. But if you don't let us know that you're struggling to oxygenate the child, we might turn up without it. High frequency, not a lot of evidence for this in kids, but if you ask any pediatric intensivist in the room today, they'll tell you there's scores of children that have been able to oxygenate and ventilate with high frequency where conventionals failed. 
you're saying, what use is that to me in the district general? I don't have a high frequency ventilator that's appropriate for use in kids. Well, the chances are you probably do. Um, a lot of the neonatal ventilators uh, in your hospital at the switch of a button, it depends obviously what ones you use, but the ones certainly we have in Northern Ireland uh, at a switch of a button can turn from conventional to high frequency. And they can be used in older children. In fact, uh, our backup high frequency ventilator in the PIC was actually one of these neonatal ventilators for a while. Um, we're obviously not going to be able to move the child on high frequency, but if it lets you get them stabilised, it allows us time to explore other options, and one of those may be making an ECMO referral um, from the District General. Okay, so that was a run through the starting settings. Um, a system that you can use to troubleshoot when things go wrong, but hopefully a few pearls in there as well for you and how to avoid getting into trouble in the first place. Thank you.